or at a stage where the president is making all the presidential appointments. And as the presidential appointments are being made, uh, we notice a trend that a lot of uh, Indians and among Indians, uh, or people of Indian origin is what I mean. And among people of Indian origin, a lot of people with Hindu names uh, and Hindu, uh, presumably Hindus, are being appointed in the Biden administration. And uh, that plus, you know, we talked about a couple of weeks ago that the Mars mission uh, was, uh, you know, the, the person who was uh, uh, in charge of the Mars mission uh, landing um, was of Indian origin. And we talked about her wearing a bindi and, uh, you know, expressing her identity. And uh, President Biden had a conversation with her, Swati Mohan, her name. And I want to play this uh, conversation. Uh, I, I want to play this conversation with Sada for you and for all our, uh, for you know, for all our viewers. And I want to get your take on it, Sada. So let me let me share the screen and let me get your view on what President Biden uh, said. Okay, and let me know when you can see and hear the screen, uh, 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 the video. Indian of descent Americans are taking over the country. You, my vice president, my speechwriter. And so the Indians and Hindus have arrived. President uh, Biden has, seems to say that, uh, you know, we are now taking over the world. We are taking over America. And so that he has kind of come a long way because, uh, you know, uh, this is the president who in 2006, if, uh, for people who remember when he was a senator from Delaware, right? Uh, before he became the vice president, he said, in Delaware, the largest growth of population is Indian Americans moving from India. You cannot go to 7-Eleven or Dunkin' Donuts unless you have a slight Indian accent. I am not joking. I'm, I, this is uh, President Biden saying at the time, Senator Biden saying, I am not joking. So I guess uh, we have come a long way from uh, Dunkin' Donuts and 7-Elevens to landing a Mars mission, huh? So I have a, a couple of points to make on that. Uh, first of all, it is, it is a good uh, recognition uh, that President Biden understands and ad admits and addresses the fact that Indian Americans, uh, he didn't say Hindu Americans, so you know we have to be very clear about wh where he's coming from. Indian Americans of, uh, or Americans of Indian origin are, uh, are doing well in America and they're, they're, they're reaching places. That's a very, uh, that's, a, that's a compliment in many ways, even though it also highlights the fact that uh, President Biden actually has not been uh, fully aware of the, the role of the community over the last 20, 25 years, but that, that it is still a compliment. So that, that is number one. Number two, uh, his own remarks from a 2006, I remember those statements those days, uh, it, it played a lot on, on, uh, uh, on radios and, and TV shows because it was so prejudiced. And in, in 2006, he had remarked that he could not go to a 7-Eleven without actually uh, having an Indian accent, uh, which in a way, I think, again, it was, it's a very Biden-esque uh, statement where he means uh, something positive, but uh, you know, he, he comes up with a statement that almost sounds uh, borderline racist. So, yeah. so and, and that is, he ha he's not known to be the best ex person expressing himself. Uh, you know, he became the president, but the, he's, we still have to understand and admit to his uh, his weaknesses. So yeah. it's it's a long way to, to 16 years, uh, 15 years. He has come from uh, addressing Indian Americans uh, uh, in a very positive light. But more importantly, what comes out of this statement is something the, that should be taken by the Hindu American community as well uh, with a, with some some uh, uh, support and some happiness because he essentially put to rest a narrative that has been strongly promoted by Islamists and extreme left within the Democratic Party, and that is the South Asian narrative. I mean, it could be because Biden is so old that uh, he has never picked up on the South Asian narrative, which is 
which is a very you know last decade narrative that has per, you know prevailed within the uh, indian american youth as well as the the and promoted by the pakistani american and the islamists and the extreme left because it helps dilute the indian identity and more so the hindu identity which you know which the islamists and the muslim american community doesn't really want to grow want to see grow so so he negates inadvertently negates the south asian narrative and that is something that we we should be happy about even though he didn't probably didn't mean to right. so the, i you know i i believe that we should give credit where it's due and in this particular case uh, the president came out and recognized the contribution of uh, indian americans hindu americans he did and not mention think, hindu americans so he did not mention no no i understand i understand but and that, was, that will come to bite us to a, a decade later but that's for for let we we'll do for sure, a decade I, you know i you know look i mean i you know i i'm 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 play i'm accepting the incrementalism in a president biden accepting indians first and hindus next and at some point uh, even though in the last election cycle the president didn't recognize the fact that the 20 million people or 25 million people uh, who in some way or the other follow hindu dharma um are in the, the precepts of hindu dharma and there are only about uh, 4 million 5 million people of indian origin uh, i think uh, at some point all the politicians including president biden will realize that a hindu american is a much bigger much stronger narrative that they want to go after and and a much bigger voting population they want to go after and to that point uh, dawal joshi pura ji has joined us and on the chat uh, dawal ji is saying that the timing of biden phone to swati mohan of nasa giving the details of indians employed in the cabinet and senior positions and neeraj's withdrawal indicates that the indian vote matters uh so that i before you comment on that i want to just share this one screen with you uh, to kind of facilitate uh, your conversation so take a look at this so that uh, this is a graphic uh, that i got from socialnews.xyz uh, and you can see in this graphic that at that time when they put together this graphic uh there were 20 indian americans in the top uh, uh, given the top post in biden administration uh and then there is, i have a uh, i have a text from um, uh you can see from times of india the more recent one which says that biden has admin, uh, biden has appointed uh, now 55 indians uh every day you uh, you know you look at the indian american news and you realize there are few more uh, you know people of indian origin few more people with the hindu name are being appointed to the cabinet the number is now 55 and uh, you can you can see there are significant positions i mean like all the way from uh, you know the vice president to uh, the person uh, you know vivek murthy who has been appointed uh, who has been nominated to be uh, the uh, you know to the uh, surgeon general of united states so there is a significant number of in indian americans uh, in the administration now so also the comments on what dawal ji has said and comments on uh, some of these nominees and what uh, what sentiments it, uh, does it bring out in you well uh, i think there, there is no doubt that uh, the, there has been a significant number of indian americans who have been appointed in the administration and it is it comes from the fact that uh, indian americans especially the left leaning indian americans uh, uh, have largely uh, been the the backbone of democratic party's outreach to the uh, community and they they did a great job delivering votes for uh, president biden so so it is it is good to see that uh, uh, president biden is uh, you know appointing indian americans to that role uh again i i have to be very clear to say that n- not many of them are uh, you know very supportive of hindus or proud hindus that is that is another conversation for another day uh many of them are actually quite anti hindu but overall when it comes to indian americans i think the they they stood by the democratic party in big numbers and they also supported uh, president biden's campaign in big numbers so they are uh, getting appointments in good numbers uh that may or may not be good for india since it's you know i'm comparing apples to apples <laughs> americans to india uh, many of them are as i said not very pro hindu and india is a 80% hindu country many of them don't have the correct information on india on many issues uh, ha- have gone on the record not supporting india on many issues uh, so indian americans getting appointment 
does not translate to India benefiting from it all the time, but it is still a step in the right direction. Uh, I would rather have Indian Americans in this administration than not have them. And, and when it comes to Hindu Americans, I think there is a conversation that we needs to be had about why there is so little Hindu American identity that is promoted by the Democratic Party. We have had shows about that before. And I think it's a conversation that needs to be had because that is a strategically uh, dangerous minefield that we are entering. And it will bite us eventually in the next decade. So, uh, Utsuta, um, let me ask you uh, this question. There was a, uh, you know, uh, you know, speaking of Indians, uh, and not particularly Hindus, the high office, there's an Indian who, uh, woman who actually made somewhat of a history by uh, giving a press briefing um, in the, in the, at the White House this week, right? And uh, I mean, it's not that she, she's not the first Indian to do a press briefing, but certainly for, probably the first Indian woman. And there's some more unique things about her. So what do we know about her? Well, the, the, there was uh, Samira Fazili, uh, Indian American of Kashmiri origin, uh, who was uh, at the White House press briefing. She she is very proud, uh, maintains a very proud Islamic identity, uh, wears a hijab, and uh, has in the past been very actively supporting supportive of uh, a group that is that is anti-India and, and, and honestly speaking, that has uh, connections to terrorist organizations. So, so now, the, you know, the, that's an Indian American for, for all that counts, but that's not an Indian American we, we want at the, at the Capitol, uh, at the White House or in the administration, because clearly her, uh, her background is very, very anti-India and her connections to people uh, in Jammu and Kashmir are to people who are anti-India and who support terrorists. So, you know, that's one Indian American you didn't want there. So I, I, as I said, you know, it looks good overall and I would rather have Indian Americans in the administration than not have. But at the same time, you have to be very careful about uh, and deal, it, deal with each person in, with a pinch of salt, as I said. Absolutely. And um, so the, I, I think um, one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, that I absolutely agree with you that we will need to really build uh, this, uh, you know, a groundswell support from Hindus in America to really educate uh, the administration, this and future, that what what is significant, what is important to Hindus in America is not the people who carry Hindu names, not the people who carry Indian names, but people who actually sympathize and empathize with the American Hindu issues. And right now, by looking at the appointments of the administration, it's a mixed bag. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I think Hindus in America will have to uh, assert themselves um, to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, that the right, uh, right people are in the administration. Sometimes it's actually worse for the community to have a, someone carrying a Hindu name sitting in the administration taking anti-Hindu positions. Uh, so it is much worse to have someone like Pamela Jaipal in the Congress than to not have Pamela Jaipal in the Congress, right? Um, let's go to the. I, I think uh, I think that's uh, that's a good summary of um, you know of what we are trying to uh, you know say about the Biden statement. So let's uh, let's conclude this segment. Also, uh, issues of uh, you know report every year, and they uh, you know they ra rank the countries based on uh, the freedom, uh, based on the uh, multiple facets of freedom, whether it's freedom of press, freedom to participate in the election, the free and fair judiciary. So they they uh, they analyze these various facets of freedom in in each of the countries. And they come up with an index, and when the uh, and this index is uh, you know it basically tells uh, the world uh, or whoever le reads that report uh, as to how free overall that country is, and so that this uh, this Freedom House uh, think tank came up with a report uh, last week, and they ranked India 
the largest democracy in the world it's so that the largest democracy in the world they rank them they used to always consistently rank india as free but now they have ranked india as mostly free not free but mostly free is that the right one or uh, should i have uh, should i have this one i think i i think uh, you know i think we we are giving too much importance to freedom house it it is not the, it has the word freedom in it that doesn't mean it is about freedom uh, it is about interests and uh, agendas and uh, in this case because of the nature of the funding it gets uh, about uh, you know promoting a certain ideological perspective and after the toolkit episode uh, after the way uh, the anti caa protests anti 370 protests uh, the, the so called farmers protests spanned out in india over the last year year and a half i would have been surprised if they had actually you know kept india as a free country because they are the same people who who make the toolkits so <laughs> it's they are the american they are the washington back end of the you know the toolkit folks uh, or the greater thunbergs of the world so it is it is a logical uh, step they have taken it this should have been expected for people who follow these things this doesn't affect in india india in any way it doesn't affect freedom in india in any way uh, india is probably of much more freer country than and than america i would say in many ways uh, and uh, and we can discuss those things over the next uh, 15 minutes or so but uh, yeah I, i don't think we should even worry about the freedom house reports it is a partisan organization it has an agenda to peddle you you just happen to be india just happens to be at its crosshairs uh, in the past 6 months 1 year 2 years and it's going to continue to stay that way as long as prime minister modi stays in power and continues to make the reforms that he's making he's going to stay that way because these guys don't like reforms these guys like india to be a third world country with a, with a huge market and then so that i i agree with you uh my as as always my concern is what is the impact this is going to have on hindus in america right and that uh, that impact on the next generation of hindus is significant i mean i know that in india nobody cares about freedom house report but i mean other than the leftists in india and their partners in the uh, leftists in the you know media and their partners were on the street protesting uh, the professional protesters as they were you know as uh, prime minister of india called them so these are the people who are you know who are going to you know now tweet and retweet and keep posting on various social media and just you know in a closed uh, echo chamber uh, uh, you know they basically going to amplify the sound and the more they amplify the less support they get from the masses in india and the less support they you know and and more uh, you know bjp keeps winning nothing you know we we sit in america we really have not much to do with the politics of india um what we are concerned about is what is the impact that is going to have on the hindus in america and i think that you know and and the kind of narrative that builds up here then uh, prompts the youth the indian youth the hindu youth to say i'm not indian i'm not hindu i'm a south asian and that actually goes back to the thing you were you were talking about earlier which is this uh, deidentification of hindus robbing them uh, robbing hindus of their identity Uh, robbing uh, people of indian uh, descent who carry 10000 years of uh, civilizational achievements robbing them of their civilizational achievements and uh, and making them part of something you know that is uh, to be ashamed of rather than something to be proud of absolutely and i think that is happening that will continue to happen and and institutions like the freedom house uh, will uh, uh, exacerbate that and that is true so it brings me to the next point which is uh, how do we deal with it so again you know this is just freedom house is the new york times of the philanthropy world so you are going to have more 
reports like Freedom House coming. I mean, if you notice the Time Magazine international cover today, it's about the far so-called farmers protest. I mean, that that's what the outcome was known to be. I mean, after Greta Thunberg released that toolkit, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to throw even more resources into their into this inf investment. So, you know, it's a challenge. Unfortunately, it's a challenge that has going that is going to become a civilizational challenge for the Hindu Americans because unlike many other countries where this uh, cabal of geopolitical uh, globalist left and Islamists are working together to to control and 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 take control you know and, and manage uh, countries, many of those countries are already Christian countries. Many of those countries are already part of Western civilization, so. They don't have an added impetus to de destroy and demean their uh, native native religion and culture. In our case, it's a double whammy because, in doing their geopolitical bidding, in doing their anti-India uh, uh, objectives, in you know, in in bringing out their anti-India perspective, they are also going to as a you know as a side game they are also going to destroy the hindu narrative and the hindu civilizational perspective because that stands in the way of attacking india as a country yeah. so india is in the crosshairs of these geopolitical forces for completely different reasons but hindu civilization stands in the way of them defeating india and you know metaphorically speaking recolonizing it and they will go after hindu civilization and by extension, American Hindus to bring it down. So brace for it. In the next 10 years, you would have even more anti-Hindu narrative being built in institution at an institutional level in America. Freedom House is an institution. New York Times is an institution. So these are revered institutions that will surprisingly be very crass and very aggressive and you know and brutal and ruthless in their anti-Hindu narrative. And you can see that. You can see that. People will be surprised by how ruthless they are, but when you are at their crosshairs, you will feel it. Well, so let me show you how blatantly, uh, you know, misleading this report and the underlying assumptions in this report are. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to share some slides, and I have I have a few notes here. So. Uh, here is one of the things, one of the questions, uh, as I told you, there are multiple categories and they, uh, each of the categories, they, you know, they describe um, how they arrived at a particular rating and then on a scale of one to four, they give the rating. So one of the, one of the, uh, one of the parameters uh, the, uh, on which the freedom is ranked is this question, do various segments of population, including ethnic, racial, religious, gender, LGBT plus, and other relevant groups have full political rights and electoral opportunities. Now, so the, I, you know, remember, India is a country with a very long history, and at the same time, very recent, painful recent memories. In India, whether you know, it's a as a democracy right from the independent way, before even independence, there were provincial elections in India. And at that time, in order to ensure that all people get appropriate representation, India actually broke the first principle of democracy of one person, one vote. And India, in order to appease the minority in India, India came up with religion-based electorates, and so if you were if you didn't if you were a minority in a particular in a particular constituency, your vote almost did not matter, and this was tilted highly against Hindus, and this was in 1920s and 30s, and what happened? Those kind of, that kind of appeasement of separating out the constituency by religion led to eventual partition of India. Okay, so India has already tried that. So now what India is doing is what America does, what UK does, what France does, what Germany does, what every other democracy in the world, Japan does, which is one person, one vote, 
and do not segregate the constituencies by religion. However, India goes a step beyond. There are marginalized classes in India, people who have suffered historic wrongs, and for those people, there are seats set aside, constituencies set aside. Other democracies do not do that. Canada doesn't do that, United States doesn't do that. And then based on the plurality of the vote, a person gets elected. Fair democracy. Now, if you look at the, in, in a fair democracy, to rank the country based on how many Muslims got elected or how many women, you know, uh, how many Christians got elected or how many Hindus got elected cannot be the criteria for judging democracy. We don't judge the democracy in America by saying how many, uh, what percentage of Hispanic Americans got elected to Senate and how many African Americans or how many people from particular nationality got elected to United States Senate, how many are Catholics, how many are Protestants, how many are uh, Mormons, how many are, you know, Baptists. We don't do that. We don't do that because we want people, uh, the politicians, to compete for all the votes. And based on the plurality of the vote, as a true democracy should uh, assured, the people get elected. So to say that just 5% of chamber and uh, out of 14% population, what kind of ridiculous calculation is that? And then to add the CAA to that, and CAA, which is meant to give refugee status to people who are fleeing persecution, and to add that, to political rights and electoral opportunity shows not just hypocrisy, but the fact that there is very little value assigned to human rights, a persecution of minority by Freedom House. Okay, and look at, you know, if you read this text, well, it says that uh, the uh, government is trying to create the National Council uh, Registry or uh, Register of Citizen, something the Supreme Court of India has mandated because people in Assam were faced with millions of people illegally crossing the border from Bangladesh. So Supreme Court mandated that we segregate the citizens from people who illegally entered the country and are trying to uh, skew the demographics, trying to skew the electorate and get people elected who would let few more million people come and stay there illegally. So are your comments. Well, Ajabhai, the thing is, as you noted very rightly, uh, you know, the, it's the tail wagging the dog here in, in the Freedom House report they already had decided that they had to make India look bad. And then they went around looking for, uh, you know, semantics to make it work. So just to see how ridiculous this report is, imagine, uh, you know, a global organization <clears throat> declaring, declaring American democracy to be sham based on the fact that the only Hindu American presidential candidate who actually had one delegates in, in the Democratic Party was not allowed to speak at the Democratic Party convention. And therefore, this current presidential election stands null and void because it's not real democracy. I mean, would you hear that narrative from Freedom House about America? No. Would you hear that narrative from any Western, uh, you know, global watchdog organization about any other Western country? No. But this is exactly the language and the narrative that Freedom House came up with to make India, uh, you know, to declare India as not being free. So, you know, this, these kinds of uh, juggling of semantics, uh, it, it probably works. I, I am pretty sure that 80% of the people who will quote Freedom House reports to target India will never actually read the report. And that is, that is the goal of these organizations. They, they are here to create and amplify an existing narrative that is being built on false pretenses. So now let's go to this next one, and that is freedom of expression and belief. I made some notes here, but uh, you know, 
Tell me what you think. This is the question where it says, so I'm, I'm not picking, there are a lot of questions here. I've only picked a handful of them just to give people a flavor of what kind of thinking goes into building anti-Hindu uh, narrative in America with government funding. Okay, so this is a question, are there free and independent media in India? So I, mean, I thought that we have in India, the buyer and caravan and economics and political weekly and a whole bunch of English papers and some regional papers were blatantly anti-Hindu and they all flourish, right? Well, you know, I was reading a statistics yesterday and, uh, you know, people who are active on social media probably have also seen it. There have been 488,000 articles in the media complaining about how Prime Minister Narendra Modi is stopping the media about writing against him. So, so there are half a million articles complaining about how they are being stopped from writing about Modi. <laughs> So you see the irony in this in this whole buildup, right? Four hundred and eighty-eight thousand articles complaining about why those articles are are not, you know, there are more of them. So, so you know, it's, it's a self-defeating. It's a self-defeating uh, narrative these people push. Uh, you know, they. I would want. They, I want. To, I would want to see. You know, how many articles they have in China in Chinese media about the Chinese Communist Party criticizing the Chinese Communist Party. That would be a good measure to, you know, the same people should, should do an apples to apples comparison, you know, and, and see, and for that matter, even Russia inside, I mean, Russian media outlets, uh, you know, write against Putin with, in Russia. So, you know, if there are half a million articles in India about India muzzling the media, then uh, I think they're defeating their own purpose. And I think that's what people see. That's why, you know, overall people don't get affected by this. It's the same professional protesters, the, the people whose livelihood depends on global anarchy and, 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 uh, and, and you know, conflict. They are the ones who, who keep peddling this and, you know, amplifying this. But overall people don't. And our kids will get negatively affected. Again, it brings us back to the same problem. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. It's the American Hindu kids, the, the American Hindus, who eventually will be influenced by this to become anti-Hindu. And that is going to be the tragedy of our generation. Yeah. So the, some of these things are so ridiculous. I don't even know where to start talking about them. There was a pandemic last year yeah. and the projections about India were really grave because it's a, it is a billion and a quarter people living in India in a much more De population, uh, you know, uh, much higher population density than uh, people live in America or people live in Western Europe or even South America or even Africa, right? And this much more highly, uh, much more dense in terms of uh, uh, densely populated country. And uh, a lot of people live in rural areas. Uh, a lot of people who have, uh, you know, the, the uh, scientific education in India is not as high and the, uh, the Indian population had not faced the pandemic as COVID-19 before. And so these the projections were really grave that a lot of, that millions and millions of Indians uh, may die because of COVID-19. So the Prime Minister of India, Prime Minister Modi, got the media together and said, please, uh, you know, uh, spread the education about COVID-19, educate the people about social distancing, educate the people about self-isolation if you have any symptoms and don't spread unnecessary negativity or rumors or pessimism because you want to keep the spirits of the country high where people are, you know, in general, people are poorer than in a lot of other countries. And you want to make sure that this pessimism and the doom and gloom does not take over while you are locking down the country, while people are getting out of, people who are in the service industry and people who are in construction industry and people in the other industries are being put out of jobs and government is still trying to come up with the ways to support them, to get them food, to get them back to the, if they're internal migrants, so if they're going to other states to work, to get them back to their home state and to villages where they came from. 
And so the prime minister does this press conference, a video conference, and tells the media to help play a constructive role. And now that is considered to be, uh, you know, uh, that is considered to be a negative. Telling media not to spread fake news, about fake scientific news about COVID-19 is now considered to be anti-freedom of press, anti-freedom of expression, and anti-freedom of belief. What do you make of this? Well, somebody I mean, you're on mute again. No, yeah, yeah. No, I was, I put myself on mute because my daughter is, makes noise behind me. So I, I try ah. to make sure that you, you don't get interrupted when- No, no, that's fine, thank you. Yeah, so, you know, I think, uh, I think the whole point here is that if you compare this to how, you know, in, in, in the last year or so, how American media looked at uh, messaging on COVID. I mean, American media uh, muzzled their own president, elected president, and, and started uh, putting, uh, you know, fact checking and, and, and literally deleting accounts, deleting uh, tweets, deleting, uh, you know. So I think it's, it's just very clear that, you know, this Freedom House report is just uh, looking at ways, it is wagging, it's the tail wagging the dog. It's, they're looking at ways to target India. They, they came up with any excuse I mean, any non-excuse and try to make it into an excuse to target India. I mean, if misinformation was being spread about COVID and the government of India urges media to stop doing that, they did the right thing. And to call it muzzling of information, will, will, American, uh, will Freedom House uh, go after America for uh, muzzling QAnon uh, uh, media outlets and, and banning them and deplatforming them? Will Freedom House go after uh, America for... Uh, for muzzling uh, a parlor and uh, literally, literally ensuring that parlor doesn't exist for two months, uh, and all the all the media information coming through parlor was was taken taken off. So, you know, <laughs> if people who who care, people who are looking slightly deeper, will see the hypocrisy and the and the agenda driven politics here. So the, I, 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 I did not highlight uh, this particular few narratives that come out of this particular slide, but I, 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 as you were speaking, I was highlighting this because this another, uh, is another area where the hypocrisy of, of Freedom House is exposed. Um, the first is um, they're talking about, you know, cow vigilantes and from 2012 to 2018. Uh, they stopped at 2018 because in 2019 and 20 there were no cases um, of uh, you know that recorded in uh, you know uh, of death, but I you know no killing okay for whatever reason I I don't even know if this is related to um, uh, cow killings or uh, cow vigilantes or as they call it or what it is about, but the 45 uh, deaths in about eight years 2012 to 2020. Every death matters. Uh, I don't know if this is related to cow vigilantes or not, or whatever it is. Uh, first of all, the term itself doesn't really make much sense to me. A murder is a murder. If it is a murder, treat it as a murder and prosecute it as a murder. I, but I have a problem with it. So there is selective, selective quoting of statistics. And the reason I say that is because if we, you know, we have been doing this show for 44 weeks now. And how many times have we talked about uh, the killing of Hindus for, you know, just because they're practicing Hindu dharma in India, where 80% 80 80 of uh, people follow Hindu dharma. And if you, if you remember, one of the earliest shows we did was three sadhus who were passing through Palgar in Maharashtra and their car broke down and they were pulled out of their car and they were beaten to death. Okay, in West Bengal, uh, there were so many people in last four or six months who have been hung from the tree as, a, as, a, as an act of, you know, so-called lynching or murder by hanging. Last week, we talked about a, 
RSS Prachara, or RSS, uh, uh, you know, RSS Swam Sevak, rather, in Kerala, who was beaten to death. And this happens in Kerala every other week. But that doesn't make it to the statistics because it does not uh, fit a preordained narrative that they have in mind. They talk about judiciary, but then when a Supreme Court of India says that a, a temple demolished 460 years ago should be rebuilt because there's enough, enough evidence that there used to be a temple here that was destroyed. They count that as against faith. At the same time, very equivalent, uh, very equivalent um, cases in America where the monuments to slavery are brought down, that's considered freedom movement. But India's monument to slavery coming down is considered to be something against a freedom of religion, unlawful destruction. Taking down a monument to a slave owner like Babri, uh, like Babri structure is not acceptable, but taking down uh, statues of slave owners or slave traders in America, in UK is considered a sign of freedom. And finally, in this uh, same, uh, same question, they are against Indian constitution, which says that you cannot have conversion with force or allurement for or fraud, because that is considered to be uh, somehow, somehow against the freedom of religion. How much more biased, so how much more biased can this report get? Well, it, it, it can get more biased, trust me. If in today's world of misinformation and disinformation as a tool for psychological warfare, it can get worse. So uh, don't 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 feel like this is this is the last of what you what you have seen coming. You, you know they will make Hindus hang Hindus from trees. <laughs> That's their goal, uh, and and this is this is uh, how how they will go about doing it. And this is not the first time this has happened in the world. Uh, it's just that we as a civilizational entity are at the crosshairs right now. It's it's a 21st century uh, method of conflict you know, conflict, increasing conflicts. Uh, it's it's fault line fishing. It's it's going to keep increasing. It's going to dig into the fault lines that exist in such a diverse society that India is. And, uh, and, and Hindu Americans are in America. So the whole purpose our viewers should understand why we are speaking about this so much is not because how much it affects India. That is given. And, you know, that is, there will be other people who will be talking about it as well, like us. The reason we are talking about it is because this is going to come and affect us in America as Hindu Americans. Absolutely. And that's that. I, I want everybody who watches the show to understand that. Because so they talk about this one, uh, the freedom of, freedom of assembly um, in a country where uh, millions of farmers, as you said, are blocking the highways. Uh, uh, you know, thousands of people are blocking one of the main arteries in Delhi, capital of India. Uh, no freedom of assembly. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I would want uh, let let the freedom house people have a Muharram procession in front of their office in DC, and see how they feel about freedom of assembly. You know, uh, so the, this uh, and then uh, uh, you know the, those those kinds of things remind me of a Hindi song. I don't know if you know this song. It's like "Jhoot Bole Kawa Kate." <laughs> of course, I know this song. I mean, everybody who has spent more than five years in India, probably, especially in the '90s or '80s, would have known this song. But uh, you know, I I really think we we don't have the ability to uh, do anything uh, to discredit Freedom House. They are they are a, they are the the Goliath, and we, we at most we are trying you know to put it in a Western context and for pe people to understand in Western phraseology. You know, we are barely the Davids and they are the Goliaths. So, yeah. Hey, so what about this? Um, 
is freedom of for non governmental organizations our favorite ngos particularly those engaged in human rights and governance related work uh, you know so the uh, i thought that uh, soros had committed a billion dollars to dethrone the current government in india how is uh, uh, so why would there be uh, you know uh, is that kind of uh, does he need to spend more or what's the problem here well the george soros has spent uh, close to a bill more to, he has committed more than a billion dollars to uh, destabilize india he has you know very you know something that is very blatantly what he did was to go and actually have a meeting with prime minister imran khan of pakistan i mean if there was ever a signal of <laughs> more ominous signal coming down india's way he met imran khan a year ago and i'm wondering what was the conversation between george soros and imran khan about you know it's is it coincidental that right after that all these khalistani organizations became human rights organization and dalit organizations <laughs> over you were talking about uh, you know how good uh, pakistan is doing uh, in human rights and how the world should be related uh, maybe soros will put more money into pakistan for our doing an amazing job with human rights and yeah, my, wiping out it, uh, pakistan, it, right? it, it, uh, native minority populations maybe he's trying to reward pakistan for uh, uh, amazing human rights jobs that they have done not just in pakistan but in any many other parts of the world including in in afghanistan where 3000 american uh, young men and women in uniform were killed through pakistan's support yeah so oh, soros can go ahead and do those things yeah why not yeah it's, it's so we talked about this about the independent judiciary i thought that one of the you know one of the things that india has always been praised by everyone in this uh, you know who looks at india analyzes and studies indian democracy is that indian judiciary is uh, especially the supreme court um is by and large not just by and large it is actually very independent in fact uh, the uh, appointments to supreme court are done by the collegium of the justices themselves to take out the politics out of it and to say that the uh, judiciary in india is not free and fair uh, because again because of the uh, you know the ramzanmi mandir is uh, you know again it, it's kind of a, we talked about it just a couple of minutes ago this is just uh you know promoting anti hindu propaganda buying into it and then amplifying it yeah i i mean yeah, i agree with you and uh, you know i think uh, the judiciary in india was good until the ram janmabhoomi movement verdict came and then judiciary became bad because yeah. because you know how dare uh, a native civilization recover a symbol of its heritage when in, in the entire world they have been reduced to rubble or relegated to the museums so i mean how dare we do that so yeah so the, the judiciary was free until the ram janm bhoomi movie movement verdict came and then now it is a uh, it is not free it is uh, modi's puppet as they will eventually call it <laughs> you know it's on this one the laws policies and practices guarantee equal treatment of various segments of the population and then it goes around and says uh, you know it talks about the other backward caste classes and members of these population face routine discrimination violence now again look every country has uh, people who in some way or the other historically have faced discrimination and we are never for it we want justice for everyone Hindu Dharma says that everyone should be accorded equal rights. Everyone should be accorded, uh, you know, uh, you know, fair. Uh, uh, everyone should be a Vasudha Kudumba Kam, right? Entire universe is one family, and uh, and Hindu Dharma also says Sarve Sukhino Bhavantu. That means let everyone be be happy. and so so it's very you know very similar to uh, what uh, american democracy uh, propagates which is equality freedom for all liberty and uh, you know and uh, liberty and uh, in in and uh, pursuit of happiness that is what india hindu dharma thousands of years ago said but what i find interesting in this is they talk about other backward classes and they're facing routine uh, discrimination and violence Ninety percent of this report is about the Prime Minister of India, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, uh, being against freedom. 
it implies that, right? And then I come to this question, I say, wait, wait a minute, isn't the community that uh, Prime Minister Modi comes from also classified as other backward classes? And if that is the case, then, uh, you know, and he didn't really come from a political family like uh, the opposite, some of the opposition party, um, you know, people have come from and all of that. He has no political lineage that propelled him into the highest seat of the power. So there must be certain amount of uh, equal opportunity somewhere in there, right? Uh, what do you think? Well, as, as, as I said before, you know, the, most of the people I have spoken to in America who know who going on and on about, uh, you know, how Modi's anti quote unquote lower caste, anti, you know, all the anti lists that they have, I have seen that almost 100% of them. I mean, I've barely met one or two people in a sample size of 200 people who have spoken to about this in the last four or five years most of them think that Modi is a Brahmin because that's the narrative that has been fed to them. That's, that's how cut and paste this whole propaganda you know, toolkit is. They think Modi is a upper caste Brahmin, whatever that means in their mind. I, I don't think they even know what it means, uh, but that's, that's how it's repeated again and again. And that's how these people look at it because it's, that's what happens when you have propaganda. It just repeats a lie again and again, and it creates this delusion in people's mind. Most people don't know that Modi actually comes from one of the most backward uh, communities in India, historically backward communities in India. He rose through the ranks of the political party, of his political party, and you know, through his hard work. If there is ever in the history of independent India, a leader who represents the masses, who represents the the subaltern communities of India that these Harvard and you know UPenn, Columbia and Berkeley people yap about from their air conditioned rooms. It is Narendra Modi. He is the representative of that, that rise of the common man, the poor underprivileged person of India. And they just can't handle it. They don't even want to talk about it because if they do, their own ideological base, their own ideological narrative, their own ideological uh, thrust falls apart and they have no reason to do their PhDs anymore. <laughs> I would say half of Berkeley's South Asia, India uh, department would be jobless if they actually came to know that Modi, Modi is not a Brahmin. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, uh, in a election of, uh, election of uh, Prime Minister Modi is as historic when it comes to the other backward classes uh, as classified with the Indian constitution. I really personally don't believe that there is a, you know, we should be classifying people as, uh, you know, the people who have been historically marginalized and we should probably come up with a better term to describe that than to call them backward. Uh, but as it may be, it's a constitutional term that is used in India. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, ascendance of Prime Minister Modi to the highest seat of power is really in some ways no different than ascendance of uh, President Barack Obama. It is historic uh, when it comes to the, you know, ascendance of a, peop uh, you know, of a community uh, that has been historically deprived of the seat of power uh, for him to get to the power. I mean, that is, you know... Uh, we should be, you know, look, I mean, you know, for, you know, entire Nehru dynasty uh, belong to the so-called upper caste. And, uh, you know, so I think, I think this is a, this is a historic moment for India and for Freedom House to not, uh, you know, for a research organization like Freedom House uh, to not uh, understand that, to not really, uh, you know, grasp that is, uh, you know, is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, somewhat uh, surprising and somewhat, um, you know, bewildering as to why they would not, uh, they would have not thought about this. I mean, that just kind of, you know, negates a lot of the research, right? Well, I, I don't, as, I mean, you know, we are, we are going around in a little bit of circle here, but, uh, you know, it, it just highlights the fact, and it's, this is not just about Freedom House. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's the same narrative in, in you know in the the so-called woke uh, society in, in in America and, and by extension around the world, and it it is built on dishonesty, propaganda, and 
and a real vile approach towards a native civilization that has withstood, uh, you know, thousand years of colonization and and through so much suffering. So you know, so that is what we really need to talk about. <clears throat> I mean, if the woke, the so-called woke people in America want to be the a supporter of the underdog, as they hope and wish they are, they shouldn't be standing by the American Hindu community, the Hindus around the world, and people of India. Uh, and Prime Minister Modi, by that, by extension. All right. So now with that, um, let me let me come to the Hindu uh, good news of the week. So the, you know, uh, there is every every cloud has a silver lining, and uh, we need to recognize uh, the good news that uh, you know, uh, you know, in the Hindu community. So with that so the the Hindu good news of the week, and we have two this time. And uh, let me share my screen with you, and let me uh, let me show you the Hindu good news of the week. So that the first good news of the week um, is Gloria Arira, um, a person from Brazil, um, received the Padma Shri Award for promoting Hindu Dharma in Brazil for forty years. And we need to recognize the fact that there are, you know, there are people who are not of Indian origin, and they did not get converted by force. They did not get converted by fraud. They did not get converted by inducements. They came to Bharat, or they came in contact with someone who was practicing Hindu Dharma, maybe some guru, maybe some uh, book, and from the from their heart, they adopted the Hindu dharma. Okay, and in this particular case, Gloria Arira went back to Brazil and promoted Hindu dharma in Brazil. So that that's good news of the week, right? And I would like you to talk about the second good news of the week. So, so this is something that you have picked. Please uh, tell us a little bit, and then I'll play the video. Well, this this is a, this is a lawmaker in New Zealand who who actually called out the again the so-called woke uh, inherent woke bias, uh, and th this is he is calling out what is the outcome of the narrative that is built by the Freedom Houses and the New York Times and the Washington Post and the toolkits and the Soroses of the world. So, so he's he's a leader of the he's, he's a politician in in New Zealand, and he's calling out those politicians in New Zealand who are the direct outcomes of the media propaganda that comes out of the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Freedom Houses of the world. Uh, so, please go ahead and play it. Yep. Bruce. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I've been approached by many Australians over the weekend appalled at the Treasurer's disgraceful performance last week. He thought he was being funny attacking Labor for showing interest in New Zealand's innovative wellbeing budget. But he did so by mocking and ridiculing Indian and Hindu culture and their religious practices. He denigrated ashrams, robes, yoga and meditation. Now, The Treasurer would not make such jokes about Christians or Muslims or his own Jewish faith, would he? So why are ancient practices of Hindus and Indians so funny to him? Liberal MPs just laughed along like they're yelling now, but I was appalled. I've been to India. I spent time in ashrams, meditating, doing yoga. Yoga and meditation have been proven by modern science to have health and well-being benefits, and they're now taught in many schools. Frankly, this parliament and those opposite would function much better if we all spent a bit of time each day calming down and reflecting. Now, this wasn't a politically incorrect private remark or words taken out of context. It was a sledge in the national parliament where the highest standards should apply. Now, I don't think he was being racist, but it was culturally insensitive, the verbal equivalent of doing blackface in the chamber. He should reflect on his words and find his apology within and actually have a look at the wellbeing budget. It's interesting. It doesn't mean abandoning fiscal discipline, 
but it's founded on the idea that financial prosperity alone is not a sufficient measure of the quality of human life. It's not really that radical. Hey, so that, why do this, uh, why do this uh, anti-Hindu narrative seem to emerge from the liberal left nowadays? Uh, shouldn't they, I, I always thought that the liberal left would uh, relate more uh, to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, to the, uh, 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 to the Hindu uh, underlying principles of meditation, yoga, and uh, you know, general well-being of the human beings, right? Well, I, I don't want to say it just emerges from the liberal left. It comes from both left cent uh, all three left, center, and right. I think uh, there is a section of the liberal left that has a significant influence of Islamists on their uh, on their psyche, and they they are the ones who peddle this more. Uh, and 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 it is a global phenomenon. It's not just specific to India. It is happening in other parts of the world. Uh, so that's the part of the liberal left that becomes anti-India very fast, anti-Hindu very fast. Uh, but there is a significant portion of the center and right as well, for who for their own reasons are, are anti-India and anti-Hindu. Uh, the right has you know has its own uh, colonization history, the history of uh, conversion activities like against Hindus. So there, there, there is a, there are people from all sides. I have to say, but. There is the woke left, which is getting into this more because of the influence of the Islamists. So now with that, we come to uh, Hindu Seva Act of the Week. I want to, uh, when I, uh, while I project that, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Vanna Sharmaji for creating this uh, really nice graphics uh, for Hindu Pact. Uh, she is now the uh, Director of Marketing for Hindu Pact. And so we want to welcome her to the team. And uh, today is the International Women's Day. Um, and she has created these memes for International Women's Day. Uh, several of them, we have posted them on our Instagram, um, all related to Hindu women. And we want to take this opportunity to say that, you know, please uh, donate to uh, Hindu Pact, uh, because uh, on, this, uh, Hindu, uh, on this Women's Day, uh, where we will, uh, you know, we, we bring about the issues that are important to Hindus, uh, you would be supporting uh, the Hindu Dharma in America. And I want to, uh, you know, urge you to go to World Hindu Council, uh, US, uh, World Hindu Council America on Instagram and look at our memes and actually follow us. So you can see the, uh, you can see the memes. Uh, the five of them, I picked a couple of them, and it shows the strength uh, that of Hindu women uh, through the uh, through the thousands of years of Hindu history. These are enshrined in Hindu mandirs and other places in uh, you can see that all over India. And please, uh, uh, please do donate to hindupact.org. Um, you can go to the website hindupact.org and there's a button on the right hand side uh, says donate, click on that and uh, donate to Hindu Pact. So if, you go, uh, so if you go back a little bit, Ajay, I just wanted to clarify something. <clears throat> so, you know, first of all, Thank you so much, uh, Vandana Ji, for uh, doing this beautiful graphics and, and picking the right uh, iconography. You know, the, 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 the women in these, in these timeless uh, stone carvings are, you know, you, you can see them. It, she's carrying two short swords. Short swords are weapons, not of infantry uh, men or women, but of special forces, uh, special forces historically. You know, infantry, normal infantry carries a shield and a, an a attacking weapon, either a spear or a, or, a, or, a, or a sword. She's carrying short swords on both hands. She was a special forces of her time. And uh, that was what the most interesting uh, thing was about this, uh, this uh, particular carving. And Ajayba, you mentioned there in, in temples and historical monuments across India, they're in temples and historical monuments across Asia. They, all the way from, you know, they, they are images and iconography in, in what is present day Pakistan and Afghanistan, all the way to what is present day Malaysia, Indonesia, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So uh, this was across the Hindu dharmic tradition in entire a Asia, not just India. I just wanted to put that. And then archery, I mean, every, every aspect of warfare and every aspect of spirituality um, 
in india uh, you know women uh, historically women led uh, so Archer, this it's a it's a double curved bow which is uh, you know which if you believe the leftist historians of the indian subcontinent didn't exist in india indians used to make bows out of bamboos uh, and and the double curved bow was something that the mongols and the turks brought to the indian subcontinent so there you go uh, Uh, so there, and with that, we come to the very final. Uh, very uh, so, this is again Hindu Seva Act of the Week. We already mentioned Hindu Pact. That all, please do donate generously to us, and uh, we then go to the final, final segment. It's so the of uh, Hindu phobe of the week. Well, the Hindu hater of the week. I think you have the wrong slide, Ajay. Why you need to? I, I, no, I have not gone to that slide yet. But so that we, we uh, it was called Hindu phobe of the week. Um, because uh, you know, we we have to uh, we have to bring the community together. So let's call Hindu phobe of the week. Uh, you know, and so that we talked about George Soros. and we talked about him meeting uh, prime minister of pakistan and compliment probably i mean, we don't know probably complimenting them on the human rights in pakistan right and look this is no, yesterday no, i'm pretty sure george soros doesn't care about human rights of anybody in pakistan george soros is focused on getting rid of uh, prime minister modi he has been open about it he has when i say he i'm just not saying he as an individual there is a whole ecosystem of woke left globalist Uh, working in conjunction with islamists they have done that in many other countries of the world most places they have failed uh, led to um, tremendous human misery just look at libya and syria the amount of human misery and suffering they brought to these places uh, not to mention the al qaeda that came with it uh, and and you know unfortunately they they want to do the same to indian subcontinent with india hopefully it's not going to work out but i mean if ever george soros is ever hearing about this and watching this show he should look into pakistan his friends imran khan what what's happening there under under imran khan and five members of the hindu family of a hindu family killed in pakistan in multan uh it's just every day happening you know it's either forced conversion or death so and this was particularly brutal because yeah. uh, they were you know uh, they were murdered with knife and axes um this was not uh, this was not just someone coming and uh, you know shooting and you know all all death is bad but you know uh, this is a particularly brutal brutal killing of a family which had forever lived in uh, in multan in pakistan it's not like these are you know the, the thousands of years of history of that family living in that area and one day just because they are hindus uh the slaves uh, the throats are slit with and they are killed with knife and axes this is you know so, so if you read the school school textbooks in pakistan uh the amount of hate that they project towards the hindu community there uh it is surprising uh, if this is an outcome of that i mean people feel it feel it's their religious duty to kill hindus there so um, that's what it leads to you know brutal murders of and 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 these people you know multan historically has been one of the centers of hindu civilization for more than 3000 years at least that's what is known to us and you know to see the people suffering there so much at the hands of islamists that's what we should be talking about that's what george soros should be talking about yeah with that somber note um, so that and uh, for a uh, you know with uh, with our condolences to whatever family uh, is left uh, to mourn for them uh, we we pay our uh, condolences pay our respects to people who were uh, who were killed in multan and with that we come to a end of our uh, show today so there uh, once again for those who are joining us thank you very much for calling thank you very much uh, sorry, uh, sorry commenting i we didn't get in calls today but thank you very much for commenting on our chat uh, we want to thank uh, all those who watched us live on facebook youtube uh, twitter and for the first time on tag tv um 
we are Hindu Lounge. Hindu Lounge is brought to you by uh, Hindu Pact, which is the policy research and advocacy collective and initiative of World Hindu Council of America with Utsal Chakravarti, uh, the executive director of Hindu Pact. I am Ajay Shah and the president of World Hindu Council of America, VHPA. We come live every week at 11 o'clock Eastern. So Utsada, we'll see you again next week on Hindu Lounge at 11 o'clock Eastern.